Tyler. How's everyone doing today? Doing pretty well. All right, some energy in the house. Uh, so a couple things. We're in the series right now going through the Gospel of Luke. You can turn to Luke chapter 8 in the Bible. The series is The Reach of Jesus. Today's message is Jesus and the Bleeding. And this is really a theme of healing that Jesus brings into our lives. So a couple times a year we have our elders who are leaders in our church available for prayer after the service. We always have a prayer team over here to my right after every service. But today after the sermon you'll have an opportunity to go over there and receive a healing prayer from the elders as well. Uh, a couple of people I want to mention, Jay and Denise are here, some of our international partners, and there they are, over to my right. Let's welcome them. <clears throat> and they serve in an area of the world in Asia where one out of every 15,000 people are Christian. One out of every 15,000 are Christians. So Jay and Denise, so glad to have you here. There's an international partners lunch right after this service. Free lunch, great time. Hear what God's doing around the world in the chapel so you can make your way over there. Also, Jean and Ann are here as well. Also to my right. And let's welcome Jean and Ann. And... They serve with Cadence uh, Ministry. Also, Jean and Ann served here at Grace for 20 years as student ministry pastor. So I meet people now, you know, like a generation later that were blessed through their ministry. And that's rare to have someone stay at one church for 20 years and work with students. So we're so grateful for your ministry, Jean and Ann. And I also, just before the service, met a pastor from um, India. And I'm just putting him on the spot. Benjamin, but would you go ahead and stand up right here, too? <laughs> And just hearing stories of what God's doing in India is inspiring, so so glad that you're here as well. This weekend is Memorial uh, Weekend, and when you think about that, it's humbling, the sacrifice that people have made so that we have the country that we have. I was looking at some numbers, and I wanted to share them with you so we don't just skip by Memorial Day weekend, but with great gratitude, and also it's somber to think about these numbers. Uh, these are the number of people who have died and laid down their lives for us in different wars. In Afghanistan, 3,000 people. In Iraq, 5,000 people. The Revolutionary War, 25,000 people. The Korean War, 54,000 people. In Vietnam, 58,000 people. World War I, 116,000 people. World War II, 405,000 people. Think about stopping Hitler and what that took. And then the Civil War, 750,000 people. FDR says this, Those who have long enjoyed such privileges as we enjoy can forget in time the people have died to win these privileges and these freedoms that we have. Eleanor Roosevelt also has this statement, Freedom makes a huge requirement of every human being. With freedom comes responsibility. So in the history of our country, there were, unfortunately, some terrible things, but also we have a legacy in our country of unselfishness and serving and even laying down our lives. And the scripture says in 1 John 3, 16, this is love, that Jesus Christ died for us and that we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So hopefully this weekend you're inspired to live an unselfish life of serving other people in our nation. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, thank you for uh, your sacrifice Sending your son. Jesus, we thank you that you died for us in our place. And we have freedom eternally that's real and lasting and is right now as well. We also thank you for those people who have served and given their lives, God. And so we don't take it for granted that we can meet here, Jesus, and proclaim your name and gather together in worship. And Lord, we pray that we would be a blessing, that we would look to serve other people. We'd seek out opportunities to give what you've given us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What was true 2,000 years ago is true today. Jesus Christ helps people regain hope and rebuild their lives and regain a sense of purpose. And he's doing that in the passage, but also he's doing that as we gather together. Jesus is alive and he's real. And just like he's moving then, he's moving right now. So let's study this passage together, but also let's keep our mind and hearts open to what Jesus wants to do in this gathering right here. We're in Luke chapter 8 and drop down to verse 40. And these, this is a passage about the healing of Jesus. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. 
As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. So we have two scenes that are interwoven, and the theme is healing. And the first one is Jairus, and he has a daughter 12 years old who's dying. I could not imagine. I have one daughter. I could not imagine if she was on her deathbed, and the doctor said she was going to die, and the desperation I would feel and want to protect her, and that's where Jairus is at. There's also a woman who's had an issue of bleeding for 12 years. No one can heal her. And so the issue continues, and it has been detrimental in so many areas of her life. And so she's also coming in this crowd to touch Jesus. We see the number 12 in both, and there is some numerology in the Bible. You think about 12 being a number of completeness or fullness, wholeness. There are 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 disciples Jesus picked. I don't think numerology is a big focus in this passage, but I will point out that both of these people, I would say, are experiencing a full amount of suffering. And maybe you've been in that situation. Maybe you're in there now where you just feel like the suffering is, is at its maximum in what you're going through on many levels. That's where they enter in, seeking Jesus. And so here's the first application. Illnesses have physical, psychological, emotional, relational, and spiritual components. Again, many levels where we need God's healing. Physical, psychological, emotional, relational, and spiritual. We live in a fallen world, and there's so much brokenness in our lives. But God mends and God heals. Each of these areas are an opportunity for Jesus to come in and do what only he can do. And we're going to see his healing power in this passage. So I have a visual today, and it's called a matroshka. If I said it correctly, uh, babushka is another word that means grandma. And if you say the two of them back to back, matroshka and babushka, it almost sounds like you're speaking in tongues. But anyways, uh, I just you could just say it's a stacking doll. That's the easiest way to say it. This matroshka right here, I want you to think about this woman who has an issue of bleeding. Because people could compartmentalize her and say, okay, that's a physical condition she has of bleeding. But they wouldn't understand of how much suffering that is happening in the different levels of her life. So as you look at this babushka right here, uh, you think about the woman and she's bleeding. But there's a whole other level uh, to what's happening in terms of her suffering. Yes, with physical bleeding, there's fatigue. And uh, there, there's also, uh, with that, a lot of pain. But on another level, what this woman's going through is fear. For a lot of people who have an issue of bleeding, they'll end up dying. And she doesn't know her future. And it feels so out of control. Then there's another issue. And she has gone to one doctor after another. Mark chapter 5 tells us that she went from physician to physician. And no one can heal her. So she's spending a lot of her time and a lot of her money going to doctors. And the Bible says she's actually getting worse. Have you ever gone from one doctor to another or had a loved one go from one doctor to another? And you know how much work that is to set up appointments, to try to get in there to a specialist, to hope you get some help, and then at the end of that, just to find out that you're actually getting worse? In addition to that, uh, she also is isolated. And this is a lot of Matroshka to hold on to. But, uh, and she is isolated. She is, there's loneliness. People uh, reject her. And so uh, she is suffering. She is not allowed to go to the temple for 12 years. Can you imagine if someone today said to you, you can't come back to church for 12 years. You can't be in a life group for 12 years. She was seen as unclean, and her own family wasn't allowed to touch her. Her own family wasn't allowed to touch anything that she touched. Do you see how deeply this runs in her life? It's not just an issue of bleeding. There are so many components that this challenge is touching. And I think about our lives and how we are hurting on so many levels, and we need God's healing on so many levels. This is kind of a picture of our lives a lot of the time. And I want to shatter the notion today, if you're viewing God as only interested in you and only loves you when you're getting A's, getting a promotion, treating everyone around you really well, having all kinds of time in the Bible and in prayer, then finally God looks down and loves you. What I want to declare today is that God is interested in you, pursues you, loves you, brings his grace and presence to you when your life looks like this. And it's easy to believe lies. It's easy to say lies. And I think one of the most common lies in our culture is two words. It's the words, I'm fine. 
How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. I know guys that every time I ask them that question, they'll say, I'm fine. I'm fine. And that's just a standard answer. And you can see that there's pain underneath, but the answer is, I'm fine. Why do we lie with each other? Why do we put on fronts? Uh, why do we hold back the real story in our lives so often? Uh, we all need God's healing on many levels. I know I didn't get an amen right there, but we all need God's healing on many levels. I got one amen. Thank you. Right there. You see me. Yeah, just keep working with me. Walk with me through this. Thank you. You got my back. Uh, let's just say that uh, I need God's healing. Say that out loud. I need God's healing. The revealing comes before the healing so often. And if you're not willing to admit it and ask God for healing, we just stay in our conditions. At the men's retreat, we had a time of healing where uh, and it was clear we all need God's healing. Men just started to stand one after another that needed healing. And then other men would come over and pray for those men. It was beautiful. It was one of my favorite times in the men's retreat is just praying for healing in different parts of our lives. So this is a picture right here of this woman's life. And it's a picture of our lives as well. God wants to bring healing on so many levels. What I want to encourage you and remind you really is that when you hear someone that's HIV positive, that's not just physical, what they're going through. When you hear that someone was physically abused or sexually abused, it's not just physical. When you hear someone's battling depression, that's not just touching one part of their life. That affects relationships. When you hear someone has cancer and what they're going through, just know that they're suffering on so many levels. And so one thing I think we can do to be an instrument of God's healing right now is I'm pretty confident you know someone who has cancer, who's battling through that right now. This week, would you pray for one person who has cancer? Would you reach out to one person that has cancer? See what physical needs they have. See how you can be an instrument of healing in their lives. As we're just reminded that when someone says cancer or AIDS, there are so many levels where love and help is needed, and God brings his love through us and through each other. So keep that picture in mind, and I'm going to set this uh, matryoshka down. Last night, sad but true story, I borrowed someone's matryoshka, and it was like this precious matryoshka with like seven layers. I thought I had it all set up there, and one of the pieces rolled out. Continued to preach last night, and all of a sudden I heard a crunch, and I looked down, and um, there's a matryoshka cleanup in aisle number four. I mean, it was, it was just um, sad. So I've apologized. Someone's trying to glue it back together. But uh, this is a dangerous endeavor right here, this matryoshka. But being real with you, and uh, that's how it goes. Not always so smooth. Let's go back to the text. Drop down to verse 44. And let's continue with how this healing plays out. Uh, she came up behind Jesus. She touched the edge of his cloak. And immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone has touched me. I know that the power has gone out from me. And then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at Jesus' feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. The application is boldly reach out to Jesus, when you have lost what is precious to you and you are dying on the inside. Have you ever felt like that? That you are dying on the inside, lost what is precious to you. Boldly reach out to Jesus. Here's Jairus' example. Who is Jairus? He was the synagogue ruler, the synagogue leader. Crispus and Sosthenes were two other synagogue leaders and rulers at that time. They had a responsibility. They took care of the temple. They were overseeing the building and the services, all the participants. They were highly respected in the community. And yet, what is this? The Greek word is adu, behold, look, who's coming to Jesus? Here he is, it's Jairus. And they're stunned, they're surprised. Religious leaders at that time, they were not flocking to Jesus. In fact, they saw a competition. They were threatened by Jesus. They talked down on Jesus. They assumed things or threw shade at Jesus. And so here's Jairus, where there'd be other Pharisees and Sadducees that would be shocked and would say, Jairus, get back. Jairus, behold, look, is coming to Jesus. Jairus is not coming as the community leader. Jairus is not coming as the ruler of the synagogue. Jairus is coming as daddy. Because his baby girl, 12 years old, is dying. 
And so he's coming to Jesus because Jesus is a healer. Jesus who says he's the Messiah. Jesus who in Luke chapter 7, there was a widow there who had a son who was dead in Nain, 20 miles away. Jesus raised this boy from the dead. Jairus has hope that if he comes to Jesus, Jesus could heal and no one else can. So he is going to come not caring what people think about him. Not caring what the Sadducees and Pharisees think about him. It tells us this, that in a crowd, people approach Jesus very differently. Some people are content to just be religious. Just say, I went to church, look at me, I'm religious, I do rituals, I went there, I was in the building. There's other people who are going to lean in, who are press in, who are going to connect with Jesus, who are not going to be satisfied just going through the motions, but they want to be close to the Savior and a crowd they're going to enter in. I encourage you when it comes to worship and prayer and seeking Jesus, don't look around and take your cues from other people. Don't wait for the religious Pharisees and Sadducees to enter in, because they might not. Don't see, hmm, is my spouse going to worship? Are my friends worshiping? What's going on in the people sitting around me? Oh, it seems to be casual. Well, then I guess I won't really worship Jesus. I encourage you to be like Jairus and say, I don't care what other people think. I'm going to connect with Jesus. Whatever that looks like in your style, God has plenty of people who have the outward words and the outward religion, but the Bible says God looks at the heart. And so is your heart hungry, eager to connect with Jesus? And you want to move past some of those obstacles in the culture and really get close to him. That's what Jairus is doing. It is bold what Jairus is doing. But Jairus is going to connect with Jesus. We also have this woman who's going to connect with Jesus. She touches Jesus' cloak. That word touch means clutch, cling to, grab hold of. Rabbis at that time, they had tassels, two in front, two in back, and it reminded them of God's commands, God's word. And so maybe she reached behind and grabbed a tassel. Maybe it was just the edge of Jesus' cloak, but she was determined to make her way through the crowd. And in Matthew chapter 9, we learn from Matthew that she was talking to herself. How many people here talk to yourself? That's right. It's a big number. That's a good thing. That's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself, preach to yourself. And so what she's saying is, if I only touch Jesus' garment, I will be healed. And that's her mindset. If I only touch, if I only connect, if I only get to Jesus. With a huge crowd around, there's almost crushing Jesus, the Bible says. She's determined, I've got to get to Jesus. I've got to be close to Jesus. That is a great thing to tell yourself every day during the day. This is my number one priority, to walk close with Jesus, to be close with Jesus, to listen to Jesus, to abide with Jesus. If I can do this, no matter what I'm going through, that's my focus. Be close to Jesus. And so she's not going to let anything hold her back. She's been ceremonially unclean for 12 years. You know what the law said? Leviticus 15, a woman with an issue of bleeding, unclean. That's what the law says. For 12 years, people were looking at her like she was second class. Has anyone ever looked at you and thought second class, second rate, they treat you like that? She was treated in that way from the whole culture. She was called unclean. She was isolated. And you know what dead religion says? You're on the outside looking in. She could feel that way. She was always on the outside of the temple. She couldn't get in there. She's on the outside looking in. Do you know how many people uh, come and even to church and they feel like they're on the outside looking in? Because of past sins, if everyone knew my stuff, I don't know the Bible as well as other people, I don't know many people around here, it's easy to feel like you're on the outside looking in. I hope that no one feels like they're on the outside looking in at Grace Community Church. We are all one family, and here's the difference. Law tries to keep you on the outside looking in, And dead religion tries to do that. And she reaches out and touches Jesus. And what a moment where she's waiting. What's going to be Jesus' reaction? Is Jesus going to look over with condemnation? Is he going to lift up his nose? Is there going to be rejection? Is it going to be harsh, scolding? Is is she going to be excluded? Is that going to be the reaction? But no, she touches Jesus. And you know what she receives? 
grace. Isn't grace beautiful? Isn't grace radical? That same grace that changes our lives. She sees that look in Jesus' eye. She experiences healing, acceptance, compassion, power, care, so much different than the other religious leaders. She's connecting with Jesus. And so Jesus is going to exalt women. Uh, in that time, women were second rate in that culture. Jesus is going to lift up women and say, no, women are not second class. Jesus is going to reach this one who everyone else is overlooking. Jesus has compassion. Everyone else is defiled. Jesus invites and heals. And so this woman was ceremonially unclean. She's going to become ceremonially clean. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. We've all sinned against God, fall short of his glory. But Jesus makes us, the Bible says, righteous, holy, priests forever. And it's all his gift. He became sin so that we could be accepted in his family, forgiven, righteous for eternity. What a gift. What a transaction. And this healing points to that exchange as well. And so Jesus asked the question, who touched me? Jesus knows. The disciples, they don't really get it. Uh, Master, I mean, everyone's touched you. The crowd's almost crushed you. So many people have been in contact with you. What do you mean, who touched you? We, we don't get it. Jesus says, no, the power has flowed out, healing power, and there's been a healing. And Jesus knows what's happened. Why would Jesus ask that question, who touched me? The woman knows why he'd ask that question because she's trying to figure out after the healing what should she do should she stay quiet should she just exit the scene should she pretend like she doesn't know what just happened jesus says who touched me so that the woman would emerge and share her story i'm the one who's been bleeding for the last 12 years but Jesus just touched me, and I am healed. It was instant. That's my story. That's why I touched him. That's the healing that happened. And so when God heals you, has God ever healed you in any way? Emotionally, relationally, spiritually, part of the healing is that you share your story. When she shares her story, that's part of her healing. Then there's other people who are inspired. Other people are drawn to Jesus. Jesus is glorified. If there's a healing story in your life, don't pretend like it didn't happen. Don't try and exit quietly. Share your story. Glorify the Lord of what he's done, how good he is, so that others can enter into that healing and will be drawn to him. So she shares that story, and it's powerful. She identifies with Jesus. And I think all of us uh, can identify with this woman as well. Express your fate. She ends up at Jesus' feet. Jairus at Jesus' feet. This woman at Jesus' feet. It's a really good place to be. At Jesus' feet, close to him, receiving, abiding, listening, humble. It's a great place to be in life, in your spirit, in your heart, in your relationship with God. Now the story gets better. Drop down to verse 48. We read, Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus turned to Jairus and said, Don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. The application, there are no limits to how deeply Jesus can heal. There are no limits to how deeply Jesus can heal. Here's an important distinction. And uh, notice this, when it comes to faith, putting your trust in Jesus Christ, you experience the forgiveness of sins. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, will be forgiven and have eternal life. That is a promise. Faith in Christ always results in salvation every time. But physical healing is different, and there's some mystery there. Some people put their faith in Jesus, ask for physical healing, and they receive it. Other people have faith in Jesus, and they ask for physical healing, 
but it doesn't come. And sometimes people die. And God knows when to bring people home. So there's some mystery as far as physical healing. There's other people who've rejected Jesus, but God still physically heals them. And that's his grace. He wants to heal them in their soul. And he wants them to be in heaven. He wants everyone to be in heaven eternally. But some people he'll physically heal who reject him. That's his grace as well. What we know is that God is a healer. And he wants to heal in different parts of our lives. It's always good to have faith in Jesus. It's always good to ask for healing. And ask for healing for yourself and for other people. And then trust him with the results. So here's the healing that happens. I'm going to pick up this Matryoshka again. And uh, all these different pieces we have as we think about this woman. So uh, this woman is going to experience healing. When Jesus says the word daughter to her, that is a word that's only used once in the New Testament, and it's a term of affection and tenderness. If you've been rejected for 12 years, and there's a voice and a tone of affection and tenderness, and it's coming from the Messiah, that brings healing. And so there was restoration that happened there. There was restoration that happened physically when her issue of bleeding stopped. There was restoration that happened when Jesus had her tell the story publicly. What everyone was hearing is that this woman is now publicly, she is clean, uh, ceremonially clean. She can re-enter the temple. Everyone can know that that healing has happened. A relationship with Jesus is the deepest healing in your soul, in connecting with him. What's happening in this woman's life is this restoration. God restores. Jesus restores. Shalom means peace, wholeness, completeness. And Jesus touches every part of our life, the emotional pain, the relational pain, and he's healing and restoring this woman in a beautiful picture that only Jesus can do. Go to Jesus today for that restoration. And you'd think that everyone would see that and applaud and praise the Lord and honor him. And, you know, there it is. Worship just breaks out. But no. What's the next voice that we hear after this healing? It's someone from Jairus' house. And what do they say? Your daughter's dead. The voice of death, the voice of discouragement comes in right after the healing. This declaration of doom, this determination that it's over. Don't bother Jesus anymore. And what's implied in all that is that Jesus blew it because he was there too late because he's spending time healing this woman. His timing is awful. The girl is dead. And the funeral's already starting. The funeral's already fully going. This determination of despair. What does Jesus say after that declaration of death? What does Jesus say? He comes alongside to Jairus and says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Believe me, she's going to live. You have a lot of voices during the week. A lot of different people talking to you during the week. There's one voice that's most important. And if there's a lot of voices of discouragement, the one voice I encourage you to listen to is Jesus. My sheep know my voice. His voice is the one that matters. When Jesus says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. When Jesus says she's going to live, that's the only voice Jairus needs. It's the only declaration to believe. Because if Jesus says it's going to happen, it's done. You can believe him. He's faithful. He'll back it up. So be careful with all the noise pollution we have in our culture. Make sure that you take time and space and your heart is tuned in to hear Jesus and follow closely with the Lord. And don't miss it that Jesus spent time with this unclean woman that everyone would say is defiled. And he said to Jairus, who's the big shot synagogue ruler, not yet, because he's healing and caring for this woman. There's a lot of people in our world that would say to the woman, oh, wait, you're not that important, and would head over to Jairus' house, and oh, the synagogue ruler, and he's got money, and he's got a position, he's got prestige, let's take care of him first, and then we'll get back to the woman if there's time. That's not what Jesus does. He cares for the woman, and Jairus' household is waiting, is waiting, while Jesus is caring for this woman. And Jairus believes Jesus. How do we know there's belief? 
Jairus is not resentful. Jairus does not say, Jesus, what were you thinking? My daughter just died. Why did you spend so much time here? There's not resentment and bitterness with Jairus. This is how you can tell if someone's believing God. If you see resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness, they're not believing Jesus. If they haven't forgiven everyone fully, and if there's resentment and bitterness, they are not believing Jesus. And so Jairus also believes Jesus because he invites Jesus into his house. And what would the Pharisees and Sadducees say? Get out of here. You just touched an unclean woman. You're not coming in our house. But Jairus opens up the door and says, yes, come in this house. And he's believing Jesus that his daughter's going to be healed and that there's going to be a resuscitation. Around the daughter, who does Jesus choose? Peter, James, and John. Very intentional selection. Those were Jesus' closest three disciples that he spent the most time with, and also Jairus' parents. I want to tell you, there's a time and a place when you make selections in relationships that's really intentional and important. The Bible makes it very clear. Here's a couple of considerations. I was talking with our kids about this this weekend. When you're choosing who to date and who to marry, You want to pay attention to character and faith. Very important. When you're choosing who your closest friends are, you want to notice character. And it's important to notice faith. People are going to build you up, bring out the best in you, build up your faith. When you choose in ministry who you're going to lock arms with, it's so important. And you see it in the Bible. When you're choosing elders, when you're choosing pastors, look closely. You know, kick the tires, check the character and the faith. That's so important. And so in these arenas, you really need to make prayerful selections, the Bible says. Jesus prayed all night about who are those 12. And even then, we saw what happened with Judas as well. So be prayerful and asking God about your closest relationships and how to proceed. Well, the funeral was in full procession. How many people have been to a funeral in the last year? Yeah, quite a few, quite a few. And there's the grieving. And in our culture, there's a lot of, uh, it's kind of reflective and usually more somber in a lot of funerals. And there's crying, that there should be crying, tears and expression. But it was very different in this context. So in this culture, when there was a funeral, there was loud screaming There was wailing. People would tear their clothes. They would hire mourners to come in and wail and scream and mourn so loud. And all this funeral was going on full force. And Jesus steps into that and says, stop wailing. This is the same Jesus who said earlier to the storm, be still. He said to the one who had demons, demons, leave. He's going to say to Lazarus, who is dead, Lazarus, come forth from the grave. And he says, B, stop wailing because she is not dead, she's asleep. What does that mean? She was physically dead. Why is Jesus calling this physical death sleep? He's calling it sleep because he's declaring that he has victory over death. He has defeated death. He is redefining death, that it's only physical and short, and that he raises up from the dead. And so he's declaring that, and people are trying to understand, what did he mean by that? This is nothing short of revolutionary and good. If you miss how revolutionary Jesus is in this passage right here, you've missed the whole meaning of the passage. Jesus is a revolutionary. He's winning. He's good. And in John chapter 5, verse 28, it says, you know, don't be so amazed at this, just this. There is going to be a time where God's voice will be heard and Everyone will be raised from the grave and will come before God. And some are going to be with him in heaven forever. And those who have put their trust in Jesus. And then others who sadly dig their heels in and reject Jesus. They're going to be separated from God forever. So this resurrection is so important. A relationship with Jesus is so important. God doesn't force people to love and follow him, but he wants it with everything. He's made every way possible so we'll receive his love and forgiveness and grace. And he wants us to be with him in heaven. So this is being laid out. This gospel is being laid out in this healing story. This is how it wraps up. Drop down to verse 53. What was the reaction to Jesus? They laughed at him. 
They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. They laughed out loud. There are people who laugh at Jesus, mock Jesus. You see it on the internet, social media, comments. You see it in our culture uh, quite often. But there's many more people who laugh at Jesus with their lifestyle, who say, I'm going to call the shots. The steering wheel's mine. You think you're the Lord? No, I'm the Lord. And so there's a lot of ways to laugh at Jesus, but he will not be stopped. He heals. He's the resurrection and the life. He's our healer then and today and always will be our healer and deserves praise, not laughter, mocking, or a double life, but follow him with all our hearts. The last verse is this. Verse 56, her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Existemai means astonished, besides themselves. Literally step outside of themselves. They were blown away. Here's God, here's Messiah, he has power over death, compassion and power together, true deity. Look what he's done, look at this miracle. Uh, his timing wasn't terrible, his timing was perfect. Have you ever looked back and initially thought God's timing was terrible? And then later on, you take in all the results and you go, wow, God's timing was perfect on that one. That's what they're realizing. John MacArthur said this, notice about Jesus' character in this passage. He's accessible. You can approach Jesus. You can approach Jesus right now. There's a throne of grace. He's alive. There's a relationship. You can talk to Jesus. He's accessible. He's also available. He walks with Jairus back to his house. He spends time. He'll walk with you every day. He'll spend time with you. He's also interruptible. And that's where a lot of us struggle. He's interruptible. He's going to Jairus' house for a healing, but he's interrupted by this woman who has an issue of bleeding. He's interruptible. Spend time with her. Heal her. What do we learn from this? How accessible are you? How available? How interruptible are you? Are you flexible, teachable? Are you listening to God during the day? Or do you have an agenda and you get upset when there's an interruption or a need? You know, some of the greatest healing opportunities are going to be in the interruption. It's going to be when the needs flood at you. It's going to be someone who's hurting that you didn't expect. Not on your Google calendar, but here they are. And are you tuned into God to be a healing instrument, to speak a word, to give some encouragement, to build them up? That's how God works then, just like he works today in those moments. And there's a healing inside of a healing in this passage. There's a miracle inside of a miracle and God will touch many parts of your life and also other people's lives at the same time. It's incredible healing. If you're here today and you're bleeding, don't stay isolated. Don't be in despair. Notice how Jesus treats people who are bleeding. Here's a take home. People might distance themselves from you when you bleed, but Jesus bled so he understands and he cares. When you're at your lowest points in life, there are going to be some people, you're going to find out who your real friends are. Some people are going to not be interested. They're going to step back. They're not going to be, want to be burdened by that situation. But there's Jesus who also bled and wants to understand, heal, and care. You know, Jesus' blood is so powerful. And that's a major theme in Scripture. There's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of his blood. That is the payment that brought us redemption. And so through his blood, we have salvation. Through his blood, there's also healing. And through his blood, he relates to us in our pain, in our suffering. There is empathy. He understands. He's well acquainted with sorrows and grief. And so Jesus enters in understanding. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says this, In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Jesus' blood, the riches of God's grace, shed for us. And so he's healing. He comes close to us when we bleed. I was talking to a physician in Auburn that, uh, I was just thanking him. Praise the Lord for nurses, physicians, assistants, physicians, and the work that they do in our city. Yeah, so grateful for that. 
And, and he watches, uh, he says he's been watching online, streaming our services. But then also, here's a healing story. We think of two of our international partners, Robert and Priscilla. And it says they serve overseas and, and they're in the medical world. So they took this woman to the operating room and opened her up a bit and found that she was oozing blood here, there, and everywhere. So they called Priscilla, that's our international partner, and they talked with her about the situation. Priscilla listened to their observations, listened to the lab results, which they related, and realized how sick this lady was. There was a similar patient a few months before who had gotten worse quickly. They sent her to a larger hospital, but unfortunately she died. Hospitals in our area do not have the level of care needed to support such patients through an episode like that. One thing was noted, that this lady had problems urinating in addition to the bleeding. And this is the part I love. In such situations, Priscilla will tell you that she regularly cries out to God to give her wisdom as what to do. In this case, God brought to her mind a lecture that she heard in medical school nearly 40 years before that. How an over-distended bladder can cause bleeding problems as well as other organ dysfunction. And that turned out to be the problem. So they were able to empty her bladder, keep it emptied for some time, long enough for the healing process to start. And then the liver and kidney dysfunction also was eventually healed. Yesterday, she's well enough to go home. God helps us in our weaknesses. So we glorify him by testifying about his strength and healing. We regularly pray with our patients, ask for God's healing for them in the name of Jesus. And as we pray in what they see and the healing that they see, that they consider it in their minds and their hearts. Robert and Priscilla. Uh, the, the final take home. Praise the Lord. Good place for an amen. Um, Jesus tells them to be quiet. Opposition is rising. He knows there's going to be a time where he'll be killed in Jerusalem. Also, popularity is rising. He doesn't want to be just the miracle worker, just the teacher. He's not a military leader. He's not an economic or political leader at that time. Jesus is trying to help people, daily grace, abide with him and be his strength. Not just in a one-moment miracle, but every single day. The take-home, Jesus draws near to you so that he can be your strength. A key to life is learning how to draw close to Jesus, receive his strength, receive his healing, and abide with him every day. 